Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. In today's film, we take our cameras for the first time to Venezuela, a rugged and beautiful country at the top of South America. And in central Venezuela, there's a vast 77,000 square mile area of flat, grassy savanna and forested swamps called the Llanos, one of the richest wildlife regions in all of South America. Immense tracts of the Llanos are privately owned, enormous ranches covering tens of thousands of acres. Surprisingly, a number of the highly successful landowners have also become dedicated conservationists, opening up their property to biologists and working to protect the Llanos wildlife from the ever-increasing threats of poachers and hunters. Our film was shot on these ranches and along the banks of the Orinoco River, which splits Venezuela across the middle. The Llanos is not a place for the casual visitor. The fierce heat and voracious insects see to that. But with perseverance and the right guides, a naturalist or a filmmaker can discover many treasures, as we'll see in our film by Wolfgang Bayer. The Llanos, a vast grassy plain that stretches over much of central Venezuela. It appears quiet and pastoral, but it's a region of remarkable extremes. From May until October, rains flood most of the 77,000 square mile savanna. Large numbers of exotic creatures, like the capybara, a giant aquatic rodent, enjoy the lushness of the season. But in November, the rains cease for six months. These dramatically divergent conditions, alternating between flood and drought, forge a land of exciting variety. The animals of the Llanos have adapted to these extremes and to each other, however unlikely the combination may appear. These seasonal changes have a striking effect on most animals in the Llanos, including the spectacled caiman, a member of the alligator family. When heavy rains flood the plains during the rainy season, up to 80% of the land area is covered with water. The animals disperse, taking advantage of the spacious wetland. During the ensuing dry season, lakes shrink to ponds, forcing the animals to congregate in smaller areas. In the riparian habitat along the rivers, gallery forests provide a different habitat for a variety of animals. High in the treetops, howler monkeys communicate with that distinctive vocalization for which they're named. A territorial behavior, howling creates a sound boundary separating the various family groups.
The capuchin monkey moves through the trees with the help of a grasping prehensile tail, which acts as a fifth hand. Typically, these monkeys eat small fruits and other vegetation, supplementing their diet with insects. Down below, life is more dangerous. A caiman has caught a large freshwater eel. Safe on its high perch, the capuchin watches as the caiman struggles to swallow its prey. Cautiously, it ventures into the hostile world on the ground for a drink. As the capuchin moves warily toward the water, it's joined by another family member. These animated primates, once popular as organ grinder monkeys, live in small social groups. In this situation, the extra eyes provide insurance against a surprise attack from predators. The pond provides a rich food source for the caiman, which feeds primarily on insects, crabs, and snails. But like most predators, the caiman feeds on what's easiest to catch. The alert and agile capuchins would be difficult prey. One animal that has adapted especially well to life in the Llanos is the capybara, the world's largest rodent. Although capybaras appear to be at home on land, they're never far from the refuge of ponds or rivers where they find their favorite food. They can weigh more than 100 pounds, and their webbed feet make them strong swimmers. In the afternoon and evening hours, capybaras graze on the short grasses and aquatic plants found along the waterways. The yellow-headed caracara has a symbiotic relationship with the capybaras, feeding on the irritating ticks and flies that continually plague them. This capybara seems to enjoy the attention and rolls to give the bird access to new morsels. These cattle tyrants not only pick the parasitic bugs from the fur of the capybara, but hitch a free ride through the flooded savanna. Males have a highly developed scent gland on the ridge of their noses. Called the marillo, it secretes a sticky substance used to mark territorial boundaries. Male-dominated family groups, averaging about 10 members, occupy areas ranging from 5 to 500 acres, depending on the season. In the Llanos, capybaras can breed year-round, though mating peaks at the beginning of the rainy season in May. Four to seven babies are born in a litter. Females are able to breed when they're only 18 months old. In a 10-year lifespan, one female capybara can produce up to 70 young. In November, as the seasons shift from wet to dry, there's increasing competition for what little food and water is available. Without the rain, the once lush Llanos becomes parched. Food disappears. The drought begins to take its toll. Lakes that once covered acres of savanna are reduced to small ponds.
the cold-blooded caiman must work hard to maintain an even body temperature. The relentless heat of the sun continues to evaporate the precious water supply. The caiman tries to deepen the pool by digging into the mud. Submerging in water keeps its temperature down during the intense heat of midday. In the Llanos, an animal's ability to cope with extreme situations is the key to its survival. The caiman has developed remarkable adaptations to drought conditions. Burying itself in the mud, it can assume a state similar to hibernation and wait for the life-saving rains. Migration is another form of adaptation that enables survival. Some caimans make a ponderous trek in search of dry season ponds. Other animals don't have the option of walking away from their predicament. These fish, trapped in landlocked ponds, become more and more concentrated as the water evaporates. The fish are actually gulping for air, an adaptation that prolongs their existence, but as the shoreline shrinks, their future looks grim. Though the dry season is hard on some animals, it provides others with a rich bounty. Wading birds enjoy the annual feast provided by the fish's misfortune. It's a feeding frenzy, with birds walking through literally thousands of swarming fish. The wood stork hunts by touch, using its beak as a sensory tool, which snaps shut the instant prey is felt. A great blue heron has speared a fish, an unusual hunting technique for this bird. This wood stork's eyes seem bigger than its stomach and perhaps its beak. Unlike most of the animals in the Llanos, birds benefit from the change in habitat during the dry season. When they've had their fill, they fly away to roost along the riverbank. The cycle will repeat itself next year when fish disperse from the rivers into the flooded savanna during the rains, only to be trapped once more as the connecting waterways disappear in the drought. The drought persists and the land becomes desolate. Its inhabitants have moved elsewhere or have perished. Finally, in May, the rains sweep in from the southeast. The skies open up, filling the plains with desperately needed water. The brown, desiccated savanna begins its transformation as the first green grasses appear. The capybara welcomes this relief from the scorching heat. 
It will rain for six months, filling the plain to depths ranging from a few inches to several feet. A luxurious swamp forms, filled with lush sedges and dense aquatic plants, covering an area the size of Texas. Family groups of capybaras disperse from the concentrated dry season communities and relax in the expanded wetlands. The rain marks the beginning of the capybaras' most productive season. But a new threat has entered their world. There was little thought for wildlife and their habitat when the Llanos was transformed into cattle country. The vast savanna was the perfect place for the cattle industry, but ranching has changed the balance of nature in the Llanos. Capybaras were originally considered a pest and were killed indiscriminately. Major predators like the jaguar were exterminated systematically, disrupting the relationship between predator and prey. Spaniards settled this country in the 1500s, taming the land to European standards. Cattle and horses were introduced to the savanna. Those that escaped from captivity adapted well to the local conditions. Today, scattered bands of wild horses run free in the Llanos. The cowboys take advantage of this resource. When they need new horses, they simply go out and round them up. These Venezuelan cowboys were instrumental in the revolt against Spanish rule and won their independence in 1821. The fighting spirit seems a trait common to both man and horse in the Llanos. Fortunately, cattle ranching has had minimal impact on wildlife habitat. It has actually prevented other forms of development, such as agriculture, from spoiling habitat. And in some cases, wildlife protection has become a major priority among ranchers. This is especially true on the Pinero Ranch where a conservation program has been adopted with the aid of the World Wildlife Fund. The basic philosophy here is to make cattle breeding and wildlife conservation complementary goals. Four. 
Ranch owner Antonio Branger is determined to preserve for posterity his portion of the Llanos and its wildlife. Breeding cattle that are best suited to survive the harsh conditions here is an important part of coexisting with nature. Careful genetic records are kept and used in a program designed to develop a new breed of superior cattle. The calves are bred from stock that's able to withstand the hot tropical climate and produce a high yield of beef. Their ability to thrive in the seasonal extremes has enabled them to coexist with wildlife and is the key to their profitability. But on other ranches, losses of cattle stock are still high, and droughts alternating with floods result in low calf production. These casualties do not go to waste. They attract one of the rarest birds in the Llanos, the king vulture. The king vulture rules from the top of the hierarchy among carrion-eating birds. Other vultures step aside when the king arrives. Within the same species, there are strong internal hierarchies as well. Another family of king vultures has found the carcass, and a bloody fight ensues to drive away the intruders. Black vultures take a keen interest in the fight. They often depend on the larger birds to tear open a newly found carcass. The complex interaction between the vultures is just one part of an ecosystem which has evolved to make use of all its elements, dead or alive. All forms of native life support the vitality of the natural habitat, which in turn supports the ranching operation. This awareness has helped the Pinero Ranch develop its management plan. Preservation of habitat benefits both domestic stock and wildlife, like the scarlet ibis. The caracara not only picks parasites off the fur of capybaras, but removes the same ticks and flies from the hides of cattle. The bird has acquired an additional food source, and the cows are made more comfortable by the arrangement. Cattle and capybaras appear to coexist very well. Only for a short period during the dry season do they forage for the same grasses around the waterways. Conserving natural habitat has helped to make the Llanos one of the best bird-watching locations in the world. It's not uncommon to observe more than 100 different species in a single day. Unique adaptations like the flattened bill of the roseate spoonbill create a large surface for catching slow-moving, bottom-dwelling prey. Yeah. 
This is a Bethlehem Tiger Heron sitting on the stump. The tiger heron derives its name from its striking juvenile plumage. A common trait among many of the waders is long, stilt-like legs. Oversized feet help the wattle jacana walk on aquatic plants in search of insects. The bright red color of the scarlet ibis is directly related to its diet, feeding almost exclusively on tiny freshwater crustaceans gives their feathers the vivid hue. The exaggerated lower beak of the skimmer bird is a sensory hunting tool. A quick reflex snaps the beak closed when the skimmer encounters a fish. Nature safaris such as this have become an important financial boost to the economy of the Pinero Ranch. Look at them come up. Oh, Animals here are easy to find and surprisingly tame because hunting is no longer allowed. Tourists are willing to spend hundreds of dollars a day for the opportunity to experience this refuge for wildlife. Conservation is paying off, but it hasn't always been that way. In the 1930s, the Orinoco crocodile was ruthlessly hunted for its hide. The exotic skin was fashioned into high-priced shoes, wallets, and belts for status-minded consumers. Today, the Orinoco crocodile is nearly extinct. The largest reptile in South America, it can reach lengths of 25 feet. It will eat anything it can catch and kill, including its smaller cousin, the caiman. Since the decline of the Orinoco crocodile, the caiman population has exploded. Caimans have not only taken over the riparian territory of the crocodile, but also the ponds and lagoons developed by the ranchers for their cattle. Even roadside ditches have become additional caiman habitat. Large numbers of caimans and fish concentrate in permanent dry season ponds. Biologists are trying to find out why fish populations seem to remain relatively constant, despite the fact that the number of caimans is on the rise. They've discovered that caimans actually eat relatively few fish, preferring freshwater crabs and apple snails. 
Fish and other small animals are taken only occasionally. The opportunistic caimans have adapted extraordinarily well to the changes that ranching has brought to the Llanos. The question becomes what to do with them all. On the Pinero Ranch, biologist Lee Fitzgerald is studying the seasonal migratory patterns of caimans. In total darkness, he wades chest deep in a pond full of these crocodilians. His headlamp blinds them and makes it easier to follow their movements. Fitzgerald explains the research. Caimans are very easy to study in the dry season because they concentrate in these dry season ponds and it makes it very easy for us to capture large numbers and mark them and also to census their populations. Although caimans are not aggressive, Fitzgerald and his wife, Jenny, carefully secure the animal as a safety precaution. We take transects through all the different kinds of wetlands habitat, and then we can extrapolate those caiman densities to figure out an entire population estimate for the whole ranch. It's quite high. It's probably between 60 and 80,000 caimans. What's more interesting is to know how many caimans are in the specific areas where they will eventually be harvested. The harvest scheme is set up to remove surplus males from the population. And by removing surplus males, there will always be some males left to inseminate the females and the population growth rate won't change. Because of their value, they can be managed and that value in turn justifies the habitats and therefore the whole ecosystem they live in. These studies provide the government with the information necessary to determine the number of caimans that can be harvested safely. Only adult males are taken. Hunters select their targets by size. Only males reach lengths of six feet or more, making them easy to distinguish. The Venezuelan government is being cautious issuing only 1,000 caiman permits per year. It seems a minute percentage of the estimated 60 to 80,000 caimans on the Pinero Ranch alone. But their population must be monitored very carefully if they're to remain an important, renewable resource. Without protection, a species can disappear quickly. It happened in Colombia. Due to unregulated hunting, by 1970, the caiman was gone from Colombia.
European buyers examine the quality of the skins to determine their market value. The exotic skins eventually will turn up as expensive belts, purses and watch bands. The income generated by the annual hunt helps to defray the high expense of developing water projects on the ranches. Year-round water sources benefit wildlife as well as the domestic stock. Dams are constructed to hold the surplus water of the rainy season. Like caimans, capybaras have moved into this newly created habitat and have prospered. Their rodent heritage enables them to increase their population by up to 30% in a single year. This incredible fertility rate is the key to their potential success as a ranch animal. It's no coincidence that this roundup occurs during the religious season of Lent, when only fish can be eaten by the predominantly Catholic population. 300 years ago, the church decided that because of their aquatic nature, capybaras should be classified as fish. Their meat is still in high demand during the Lenten season. Income from the two-month harvest will pay operating expenses on El Frio Ranch for the entire year. Maintaining the natural habitat which supports the capybara makes good business sense. It not only benefits the capybara, but many other species that depend on the wetlands for food during the breeding season. Like the El Frio and Pinero ranches, the Masaguabral ranch is run with conservation in mind. Making its cattle operation compatible with wildlife and habitat protection has always been a high priority to owner Thomas Blom. Since 1944, we have been running this ranch the past 43 years. Beef cattle production has been the main issue here. And then at the same time since 44, we started to protect the wildlife too. And what I wanted to prove was that beef cattle ranching and a lot of agriculture can be done without the wildlife interfering. Wildlife increased a lot after we began to protect it, after we improved some of the habitats by pumping water into some of the lagoons. The wells were done in the old times when things were cheaper. Today, a deep well cost about half a million bolivares. In the old times, it was only about 60,000 bolivares. If we were to repeat it today, we probably wouldn't do it because of the high cost. His wells begin to pump at the end of the rainy season before everything is dried out, pumping one million gallons a day from November until the first rains arrive in late April.
the water creates a dry season oasis on his ranch. It's an effort that has produced a spectacular wildlife refuge here. This one lagoon we have here, the Guasimos Lagoon, is probably the biggest lagoon left with water during the dry season in the entire state of Guarico. When there are 90,000 ducks there and they all fly up, it's a, a tremendous noise and, and it gets almost dark when that many ducks fly over you. Bloom doesn't allow duck hunting. For him, ducks bring beauty and spiritual richness to his ranch. But his neighbors have a different attitude. Their land has been cleared to make way for rice, a profitable new crop in the Llanos. They complain that his ducks are eating their rice. But it's the ducks that face an ominous new threat. Contact with strong agricultural chemicals is proving deadly to birds. But the powerful herbicides and pesticides help to produce one of the world's highest rice yields. Ironically, studies have shown that ducks feed primarily on insects and weeds. They damage no more than 2% of the rice crop. Crop dusting with these dangerous chemicals could potentially destroy breeding populations. The close proximity of their rookery to the fields makes these egrets especially vulnerable to the toxins. Nesting sites are rapidly being converted into new fields with the success of farming. The natural ecological balance in the Llanos is also being pressured by land reform initiatives in Venezuela. Although the government is generally supportive of conservation efforts, it has made it legally attractive for squatters from overcrowded cities to settle on fallow private land. With them come pigs, which inevitably escape and become feral. Their feeding habits can damage the fragile landscape. Digging for roots and tubers, they destroy the grasslands for all the grazing animals. Efforts to totally eliminate wild pigs have been unsuccessful. Since pigs are most destructive in large numbers, constant control of their densities is a partial solution to the problem. The growth of small industries is also changing habitat. Charcoal production diminishes the sparse forest. Large logs must be used to produce charcoal, and wildlife like the howler monkey that require the larger trees as habitat are most affected by this industry. Forests are also lost to the frequent fires in the Llanos.
Egrets are among the few to benefit from the blaze. Flames drive grasshoppers and other insects to the front of the fire line. The egrets wait to gorge themselves on the hapless insects. Pasture land is rejuvenated by periodic controlled burns. A firebreak is bulldozed to limit the spread of flames. Burning old dry grasses releases nutrients into the soil. Natural fires serve the same purpose in the wild. Burning intensifies the regrowth of species that have adapted to frequent fires. Controlled burns are most effective when set at the end of the rainy season when the damp root systems will not be destroyed by the heat. Grass fires tend to burn quickly and at low temperatures, keeping the soil relatively cool. Although this field looks devastated, it is only a matter of days before new sprouts appear in the blackened earth. New growth, rich in nutrients, provides better forage for grazing animals. Thomas Blohm has a different approach. He does not burn his grass or cut down trees to make new pasture, and his cattle have benefited. During severe droughts, the cattle are able to forage in the preserved forest habitat. There's a tendency in these countries to clear down the forest and grow artificial pastures on it. But in the dry season, the pastures are simply gone, either by fire or, or chewed up by the cattle. The other places, some neighbor ranches, which have the same amount of cattle, they have heavy losses and I have hardly any. And I have the feeling that the fact that I protected the habitat for the wildlife, that helped out the cattle too. By not deforesting, allowing things to grow over with brush and forest, a lot of species are increasing. Blom decided that the best use for the abundant wildlife on Masaguaral Ranch was research. Working with international organizations, the ranch has become a haven for scientific projects. Smithsonian biologist Dr. Rudy Rudran is studying the behavior and ecology of red howler monkeys. This area is an ideal place for long-term studies because there is no habitat destruction. The habitat is left undisturbed. It's also very easy to follow animals around. The visibility is excellent for detailed observation of behavior and ecology to find out how they interact with each other. In 1976, when I started this study, the density of the red howlers uh, here was about 85 animals per square kilometer. But right now, the density is about 200 animals per square kilometer. This is an unusual situation, at least when you compare with other uh, study areas, you know, and other studies of primates. It's only rarely that you find the formation of new groups. Dr. Rudran feels this growth pattern has a direct relationship to the size of the expanding patches of forest. Blohm's philosophy is that the information gathered will enlighten the public to the needs of wildlife and habitat preservation. He has been host to 75 scientists in a single year. Well, this is uh, Gossima Sea. Uh, we tagged 
three males in this group and this, it's a multi-male group, okay? Uh, the other group that we saw earlier on was uh, had just one single male, that, which was a unimale group structure. And here we have a multi-male group structure with several males. An experiment is underway nearby. Dr. Steve Zack removes the dominant breeding female from a family group of wrens to study why other wrens decide to compete for the empty position. He feels that knowledge about what these animals do and the choices they make are important to the study of social animals in general. The future of the endangered Orinoco crocodile is brightened by the captive okay, breeding program on Massa Give it a little bit more tape. The Blome Ranch is a refuge for this intimidating and aggressive reptile, which has been almost exterminated throughout its natural habitat. Biologist John Thorbjörnarsson explains the recovery program. The whole idea of captive rearing and reintroduction is based on the fact that in the wild, the crocodiles are most vulnerable to predators when they're eggs in the nest or as small crocodiles, as hatchlings or juveniles. We take out half of the eggs to ensure against flooding or accidental uh, predator coming in and digging out the, the eggs and, and destroying the nest. The captive rearing is being done to speed population recovery of wild populations. Captive breeding projects can tend to divert the attention away from the principal problem, which is that of protection of wild animals and their habitat. So without the protection of the wild populations of crocodiles and without the protection of their habitat, captive breeding and reintroduction of crocodiles is really academic. There's no point to it because the crocodiles will just be killed or their habitat will be destroyed. Protection of the animals in the wild is the most critical thing that's involved in the conservation of the species. Blome's practical and sensitive approach to living with his environment may give many species a chance to survive into the 21st century. What is good for domestic animals in great part is good for wildlife too. If you cannot put one more cow on your ranch, you still can squeeze in a lot of wildlife. They don't compete. The Janos is on the threshold of change faced with agricultural development and land reform. But there is hope in the efforts of conservation pioneers who seek new uses for the natural system. Future generations must follow their lead to ensure the preservation of this land of remarkable contrast. The Janos. <laughs>